Hey there folks, this is the first lesson in a series about up the neck backup. The stuff I just played at the beginning of this video, that's pretty much what we're gonna learn today. Although up the neck backup is a huge category with all kinds of techniques. We'll talk about that in future episodes in this series, but for now, let's get started with something simple and solid that's gonna work on a lot of bluegrass songs. And I don't wanna waste your time, so let's just get started now. Let's first look at a simple chord shape that we're gonna move all over the fretboard to play a bunch of different chords and a bunch of different songs. That's the chord shape that we're gonna use for G, and it might be familiar to you because it's just the top three notes of this common shape. In up the neck backup and all kinds of backup, you can use the full shape or just three notes, but for right now, let's just use those top three notes. In order to get some music out of that, we have to apply a right hand pattern like this. Now that pattern is perfect for two measures of G. We're gonna look at other patterns for different durations, you know, playing for one measure or half a measure or more than two measures. But for now, let's just stick with two measures. We're gonna repeat that as much as we need to for as long as the chord happens in the song. But right now we just have one chord. So let's look at some other places we can put this shape and pattern so that we can actually play a song. And instead of just showing you where these chords are, I wanna tell you a little bit about how I think about this stuff so that you can start to figure it out for yourself as well. When I look at this chord shape for G, I'm trying to find where the G is. That way I know relative to the rest of the shape how I can find other chords. So on the first string, this top note is G. So if I play this shape somewhere else on the neck, wherever my little finger is, that's the name of the chord that I'm playing. So for instance, if I wanna play a song that has G, C, and D, then I can use that formula to find these other chords. So for instance, on the 10th fret on the first string, that's a C, if I play that same shape, I have my C chord. If I then move up to the 12th fret where there's a D on the first string, then I can play my D chord. And then if I wanna add another G all the way up here, then I just have to find another G on the first string, which is 12 frets higher than the one up here. And if you don't have a ton of fretboard knowledge right now, that's okay. You can just think about where these are and count up to the right number of frets, that's fine. But if you're interested in learning more about that, I do have a video about fretboard knowledge and a series about music theory that you can check out. I'll leave a link to those in the description of this video. By the way, if you'd like a PDF file for everything in this lesson, as well as all of my lessons, you can find that at patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo, which is actually where I put all the bonus content that you can't find here on YouTube, like bonus practice tips and backup examples, like for instance, for this lesson, you'll get more examples of ways that you can practice moving between these different chord shapes and patterns. But anyway, back to the topic at hand, if we wanna to start to play some up the neck backup, we need to combine those shapes and right hand patterns and play them all in a row according to whatever the chord progression is of the song that we're playing. Now I chose G, C, and D because those are one, four, five in the key of G. If you don't know exactly what that means, that's totally fine, but think about it this way. Those are the chords to a ton of really common bluegrass songs like Nine Pound Hammer, Blue Ridge Cabin Home. All kinds of songs include just those three chords or at least one, four, five in a bunch of different keys, depending on what key you wanna play in. So let's do one of those. Let's play Blue Ridge Cabin Home, which is just two measures of G, two measures of C, two measures of D, and then another two measures of G. And all we have to do is play the right shape at the right time and play our entire right hand pattern.
Okay, so that's pretty cool, but how do we get to that point? How do we get from just logically understanding that you play the right shape at the right time and the right hand position and turn that into actually playing up to speed, making music with it? Well, like literally anything in practicing music, it works best if you go really slowly and you play really carefully, making sure you're playing all the notes that you mean to. Even if that means it takes a while to get there, you'll get there eventually, rather than trying really hard to go really fast at first and never actually getting there. But there's actually a little bit more to it with this specific technique that we should go over that's gonna make your life a lot easier, and it's gonna sound better too. When we're moving from this shape, this G chord here, all the way up here to C, that's kind of a big jump. And at a really slow speed, we can get away with it and play each note really cleanly. But you probably noticed that when I played the faster version, I was actually sliding between the shapes. That's a pretty important part of this technique, both because it makes it possible to actually move between shapes quickly, but it also sounds more like the things that Earl Scruggs, J.D. Crow, Sandy Osborne, all the banjo greats played, which we're now learning from. So my advice is this, and it's a little counterintuitive, especially when you think about all the things that I'm usually talking about when it comes to practicing. Don't get hung up on every single note in these exercises if it gets in the way of moving between the shapes. That doesn't mean you just wanna throw out random notes and make mistakes all over the place, but there are gonna be some places where it's okay to muffle a note or slide between a note to get quickly to the next shape. And in some cases, it actually sounds better. In this case, you don't really wanna muffle or skip any notes, but you do wanna slide between them as you move from one shape to another. And you can just practice that by moving from one shape to another without even playing the right hand pattern, just playing the slide. It's not always the most precise thing, but it's a good thing to get in the habit of doing. And if you listen to the greats like Earl Scruggs and J.D. Crow, then you're gonna have a clear idea of when those things happen. Now, what if you wanna play for a different amount of time? What if the chords are shorter? If you're playing, for instance, one measure or half a measure? Well, if you're playing one measure of a chord, like for instance, G, you'll just play the second half of that example for two measures. And if you're playing for half a measure, then you'll just play this pattern. It's really exactly the same concept. We're just trying to have a pattern that will easily get us back to starting on our thumb so we can start at the beginning of one of these patterns once we switch to another chord. That's not always how this stuff gets played. This is just one example, but it's a really good place to start. So how about this? Let's look at another song like Little Georgia Rose, which includes two measure chords, one measure chords, and half measure chords. So we can use all of these examples in one song. Okay, so that's great. And technically that will carry you through so many songs in bluegrass. I know it's just major chords. We'll talk about minor chords and other types of chords in future lessons. But for right now, that covers a gigantic amount of the bluegrass catalog. But it's still just one chord shape. So it can sound a little bit like you're doing the same thing over and over again. So let's add another one. Now this again is a G chord. And again, it might be familiar to you because it's just the top three notes of this common shape. Again, we're just gonna use the top three notes, but in the future, there'll be all sorts of good reasons to use that full four note chord. So as you can probably tell, we're gonna treat this the same as our other chord shape. It's the same notes, just in a slightly different order, in a different place on the neck. 
but now we need to figure out how we can move this chord around to play our other chords like C and D. Just like we had with our other chord shape, where I was looking for the note G so I could move it around and know which chord I was playing, we need to do that with our new chord shape. And in this case, G is on the second string. So I know that when I play this shape, I'm gonna know the note on the second string is the name of the chord. So if I wanna play C and D, I need to find C and D on the second string. That happens to be on the 13th fret here for C. Up here on the 15th fret for D. And if I wanna find another G chord up higher on the neck, then I have to go all the way up to the 20th fret where there's a G on the second string. So with that information, I can kind of just do the same thing I was doing with the other chord shape, playing Blue Ridge Cabin Home and Little Georgia Rose, applying these right hand patterns for the amount of time that I need to for each chord. Again, you'll notice that it's important to slide between these shapes in order to get there on time, but also because it's kind of a nice sound. But now what if we wanna combine these shapes? What if we wanna use both of them? There are a lot of different combinations of things we could do here, but for now, let's try just doing a little bit of each shape during each chord. Not only are we sliding from one position to another, but we're actually changing the chord shape before we slide. And here's what I mean. When I get to the end of this shape, I need to go from this shape here with my middle finger on the third string and my index finger on the second string. When I get up here, those fingers switch. They're on the same fret, respectively, but they switch strings. As I shifted, the last note of this shape right here gets muffled. I'm moving my index finger to the third fret, prematurely changing the shape of the chord that I'm playing so I can slide it. It means that that's not gonna ring out, it's just gonna sound like this. And that's totally fine. In the heat of the moment when you're playing music, it doesn't really matter that much and it enables you to get to the next chord shape and it enables you to slide, so it's all good sounds. You should just be aware that you're not gonna play every single note totally clearly all the time. And in this case, you can kind of plan for it. So here's how this actually plays out at a really slow speed. I'm actually muffling one of the notes, the last note before I shift because it gives me space to get my index finger on the third string 
to slide. Again, this stuff isn't super precise and you can do it a lot of different ways, but some version of this shifting and sliding and maybe muffling a note and maybe sliding into a note can happen. But things can get a little more complicated when we apply this to Little Georgia Rose because we're just shifting more often and in places where it might not be as comfortable. But that's okay because it still works. The system still holds up playing these right hand patterns in these positions and sliding between them. So these are all good examples and they work for these songs, but the real point here is that you can play any of these shapes in any order that you want, so long as you're playing the right chord at the right time for the right amount of time. That means that really you should be coming up with your own examples. You can stick with these for as long as you need to to understand the concept and to have something to play, but as soon as you can, you probably want to be tinkering with these and putting some of the shapes in different orders or figuring out patterns that you like or putting them in different keys or applying them to different songs. These are just the examples. However, we're not done yet because we've only talked about 4-4. Four, four. What about 3-4 timing? Well, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. I have a video about rhythm, which is gonna help you understand that. But assuming you do know that, counting in terms of three instead of four, we have to change these patterns a little bit. We can use the same chord shapes, but those patterns no longer apply. But we're in luck because the patterns for three, four are so much simpler. It's just a forward roll. And given that it's just a forward roll through the whole measure, why not just apply this to some songs now? We can do that same 1-4-5 progression, G, C, D, back to G again, this time in 3-4. And of course, we want to look at other chord durations, not just two measures of each chord. So here's the chord progression for the classic bluegrass song, Before I Met You, using these three, four patterns. Okay, so that's a lot of information. A lot of shapes, a lot of patterns, a lot of songs, a lot of stuff to sift through. I get it. But don't worry about doing all of it right now. Just take what you can handle and come back when you're ready for more. But that said, you might as well get started on this now because this is just the first lesson in this series, of which there are probably gonna be many, many episodes. So if you're interested in that, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and you've liked this video, so you'll be sure to know when the next video in this series comes out. 
course, check out Patreon for all the bonus content, like bonus content for this lesson. But for now, that's gonna do it. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.